when you find your seat, please also find a copy of the scripture. And it may be that if you're not, uh, if you don't have your table of contents memorized or the books of the Bible as we call them, then you may want to kind of keep access to the table of contents because we're going to be in quite a few different passages of scripture this evening, which again is not usually how uh, how that the messages go, but it is the way it is tonight. And we are continuing in our series on uh, transcendent truth, truths that really I have have a great, great practical application, and uh, really truths that if you embrace them are open doors, or the phrase we use a lot of times in, uh, to understand something like that would be areas where you would literally turn the corner and uh, help you to come to that next place or stage in life. And uh, so if you open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we'll begin there. Also a transcendent truth would be truths that if you get wrong or if you overlook, can be that place where literally you go the wrong direction or where you run into the wall that stops you from moving forward in your faith. And there are a lot of topics, actually, aren't there? A lot of areas where, as believers, uh, it could be really the next level for us. When we, when we grasp or understand a concept, it literally takes us to, the, to a place we've never been before and gives us a perspective we've never had. Then there are also uh, the, the very same where if we get them wrong, it's like we just, we just never, never get past or beyond that point. Sometimes it's a place where we turn and go the wrong direction. If you've ever ever uh, run, and especially if you have run the same route consistently, uh, landmarks become increasingly important, don't they? Like locations. Years ago, all of the men in our church, we used to go running together. A couple nights a week, two or three nights a week, and the place of our choosing was the Pompano Airport. There's a track that a really nice walking trail, running track. People rollerblade, ride bicycles, but it's 4.2 miles around the track, and so <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun because a lot of us were just kind of at different levels as far as our endurance and speed for running. But there were several of us that all were about pretty close as far as you know who we could run with. So the more people that went, the more fun it was. The Usually when we would start running, we, you know, hey guys, let's all start running. Usually it was a matter of just trying to finish, just trying to get done. And that track is very, very long. That 4.2 miles is incredibly long the first time you've run in a long time. It's just, I don't know why it seems so long, but it just, you know, just to, it's about a mile to the first corner. And uh, just running that first mile where you see the little mark that says one mile, it's a long ways. You know, and that you're you know that's why you're still running pretty good. And then you realize, okay, I'm just ready to turn the corner, and that's uh, where we start at. That would be where we would turn the corner and go north along Dixie Highway, and uh, then you know there's you run by the Goodyear blimp hanger and the horse stables and some things like that along that area, and man, it's you got to get past that second corner I think before you pay, you make your second mile. And then the third corner is kind of where you get to where the mall area is and you run behind the parking lot. And that's a good place if you're going to cheat to uh, make sure nobody else is around and cut across the parking lot. I've always watched Charlie. He always cuts through there. He never <laughs> runs the full course. That's the area where he cheats the course and runs us. And not really. Actually, Charlie likes torture, so he probably runs extra around there. But you cut through there, and then you get to the golf course and the country club. And you're not, that's the home stretch. Kind of when you get in that area, and that's where if you got anything left, you can, and you're, just, you're finally kind of getting in a rhythm, it feels like, and you start running, and you finish the course. That home stretch is kind of the one where, you know, you see that landmark, and all of a sudden, you actually feel like you can make it. You know, you actually feel like, okay, I made it this far, I made it more than three, and so looks like I'm going to make it. And it gives you a little bit of a difference in perspective, and you're actually able to run a little better. When you get in a little bit of better shape, every one of those, you're kind of checking yourself and comparing what your time should be, what your time was, and how you feel in respect or relationship 
to how you wished you were running. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing well, that's when you kind of, you know, give it a little more. And it seems like when you get to that level, the running actually can become, I hate to say this because it seems like such a contradiction, but it can actually be enjoyable. You know, where you're actually kind of able to run with a clear head. My head normally is not clear when I'm running. Normally when I'm running, my head throbs. And uh, my, my ears turn red, my face turns red, and uh, I have pumping that goes on in my head. That my heart tries to blow my brains out every time it pumps. It's like, poof, poof, poof. So I've got pounding in my head. And then I have thoughts in my head. I don't know where they come from. But my thoughts are, this is going to kill you, you're going to die, you need to stop. This is going to kill you, you're going to die, you need to stop. This is going to kill you, you're going to die, you need to stop. You need to quit this. This is crazy. No one's making you do this. No one can make you do this. Why are you doing this? Stop. And those are the thoughts in my head. Okay. But once I've done it enough, then I start thinking, okay, guys, I'm feeling okay tonight. I'm doing all right. You know, And, and then I can run a lot better. And uh, my thoughts become more clear. Well... That's just running, but life is likened a lot of times to a race. And the transcendent truths we're talking about actually can be likened to running a race. And when you grasp or you get one of the truths that we've been looking at, and you really uh, begin to apply it and begin to understand it, it's amazing how it just opens up your perspective and introduces more thought than you could have had before. It uh, erases thoughts that are wrong thinking that uh, is contradictory, and it gets you really, uh, it really just opens up horizons that you didn't know about before you made that decision. I'm going to say a couple things about truth. Truth has very little value. I didn't say no value, but truth has very little value if it's not embraced. And... Uh, Truth, oftentimes, though it is true, and though we can be convinced on the authority of the Scripture, truth is not felt. Truth is not, uh, we don't feel confident about truth until we have committed ourselves to it. Truth doesn't have a value until it's embraced, and truth is not felt, doesn't feel true, until we've committed to it. You ever heard that something was true but you didn't know but then you were given enough evidence that you thought well I'm willing to try it and when you tried it you found out it's really true this really works there are a lot of spiritual truths that really are true and that really work but they have no value or very little value and they don't feel true until you apply them or embrace them okay so here we are in first Thessalonians chapter 9 our truth uh, transcendent truth this evening I want to look at the importance of uh, future events and uh, the applicate, practical application of them. And I, I suspect we won't get too far this evening, but I, I will tell you the uh, topics that I'd like to cover this evening that are interconnected. First one would be imminence, uh, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. It's an important truth, and it's one that's much maligned and under attack and misunderstood. Always has been. It seems as though it that it's a trend right now, although it's for the imminent return of Christ uh, to be debated. Uh, the understanding of the Bible description called the last days. That's another one that's, that's connected. And then the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus, which would be defined as the time when God's Son comes to do what people thought He was going to do the first time, that is judge the world and set up His kingdom. And I want to look at uh, the biblical uh, concept or the biblical teaching of the hope. The blessed hope. That is the hope of Christ's return or taking of, coming of, his, of his coming for the saints. And I'd like to also look at uh, the rapture. And I'm not going to give up the word rapture. I know that it's a Latin-based word, but it's a word that means to gather or to snatch up suddenly or to take up. And it's not a bad word. It's not a curse word. And I'm not going to give it up. I think the word Trinity is a fine word, don't you? Where's the word Trinity found in your Bible? It isn't. But that doesn't make it not a good word because it is a descriptive word of the triune Godhead. That is the three persons of God. And rapture is another one of those words where people who are so ignorant 
in their exposition of the Scripture or exegesis of the Scripture think that somehow uh, an English definition versus a Latin definition word or making an argument about the word that something is called makes something true or not true. Have you ever heard of just weird names for doctrines that people come up with? People have accused me, you don't believe this is something ism. You know, that's da 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 da, -da Arianism or whatever. And they make up words and you just think, I don't even know what that word means. I know what the Bible teaches, but you're, you're, and you are applying a word to something doesn't really make it, you know, a false doctrine or a correct doctrine or whatever. It's just a label. And some people are really big into labels or acronyms or abbreviations, and they just, that's just their thing. That's what they think validates something. But the reality of it is, is that the taking up of the saints, the sudden calling up of the saints, is a Bible doctrine that is plainly taught in the Scripture, and it's been called the rapture, which is uh, a Latin word, which is a fine transliteration. By the way, uh, on that same note, if you're going to throw away every word that we use in the English language because it has a root in Latin, uh, do you do know that English is a Latin-based language, don't you? And so I'm not sure what we'd have left if, <laughs> if you took that approach. But we need to be thinkers as believers. We need to think through things and realize that if somebody's throwing an argument like that, like there's no rapture because the word isn't found in the Bible, um, there are a lot of words that aren't found in the Bible. The word discipleship is not found in the Bible anywhere. But the Bible does say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What is a teacher? Well, he's a rabbi, right? We don't call it rabbiship. But uh, teaching people who are followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus are disciples, and uh, teaching believers can accurately be called discipleship, the act of teaching or making disciples. You understand? I heard a message preached one time from 1 John chapter 1 that was trying to say that 1 John was about salvation instead of about fellowship. And the argument behind that entire argument was that the word discipleship is not found anywhere in the English dictionary. Well, it is true that the word discipleship is not found anywhere in the English dictionary. And that has nothing to do with 1 John being about fellowship instead of about the gospel. Get what I'm saying? In other words, those kind of arguments are just distractions from dealing with things the Bible plainly teaches. The Bible does plainly teach that Jesus Christ is coming again, and there are passages of Scripture that address the second coming of Jesus. Uh, we're in 1 Thessalonians, right? Chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And so I'd like to, to begin there and uh, talk about, look at, read verses 9 and 10. Uh, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Okay, so Paul is talking about how that the Thessalonian church has such a testimony that they're known in Macedonia and Achaia and the regions surrounding them because of their great testimony. And uh, one of the things that was commendable about the church at Thessalonica was that they were waiting for Jesus to return. They were waiting for Jesus to return. And the second thing in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, and this is very noticeable, was that they waited for Christ to return with the understanding that they had been delivered from the wrath to come. Now that's significant because today many individuals think that wrath is for believers. That God's wrath is going to be, you know, sort of the idea of where God's blessing when it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Well, God's wrath is on the righteous and on the wicked. Well, the actual fact of the matter is that God's wrath has never been for the righteous. And there are no righteous without 
uh, Jesus Christ's Son. So the, the, the secondary or the answer to that, the disingenuous argument is, well, there are no righteous because everybody deserves God's wrath ultimately. Listen, you want to play that game, my friend. You're playing a game that just basically negates the entire effects of the cross. God's wrath has never been for the righteous. When God levied His wrath against His Son in your place, my friend, you had a substitution. You received God's grace and God's mercy, and grace is not wrath. And so it's a silly game to play, but it's a good place to begin this evening. Many believers nowadays try to say that the next event on God's calendar isn't when we meet the Lord Jesus in the air. The next event on God's calendar is when God judges the world and we go through the period of great tribulation and we're, as believers, going to be here for that and we're going to be recipients of God's great outpouring of wrath. Well, that's a really uh, fallacious teaching and it comes from a gross misunderstanding, particularly of the book of future events, Revelation. In the beginning of Revelation, John is told to write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And God, knowing language pretty well, understands past, present, and future events, right? And from John chapter 4, uh, we see the church from that perspective of, of being in the past. From John chapter really 6 through 20, we see God's wrath. We see a stage where God literally is judging the world and judging the wicked. And it is not coincidental. It's not... Uh, a lot of people ask, what are these earthquakes? Or what are these hurricanes? Or what are these tsunamis? What are these natural disasters, these great events that are happening, that are weather events? And some Christians argue, well, it's because we've been so wicked, God is judging us. Now, I do not uh, have a problem with the notion that on an individual basis, God can chastise people. Do you? In other words, you think that when you lose everything and it gets your attention, or when something goes really wrong in your life and it gets your attention and God gets, gets a hold of you, do you think that that may be chastisement? Well, you know if it is, actually. But general events that can be debated whether or not God is involved with them, my friend, are not God's wrath as we see in Revelation. In Revelation, we see supernatural events that do not happen and cannot be explained by weather. We see creatures which do not exist, angelic beings. We see, um, we see events like fire falling from heaven. We see the things that don't happen. Fire doesn't fall from heaven, folks. It's not a meteor. It's not a star. We see a third part of the earth's water turn to blood. A third part of the earth destroyed. These are not, you know, as many people try to teach back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, these are not nuclear bombs. Nuclear bombs can be very, very destructive, but they're man-made and can be explained by man's actions. The events in Revelation are supernatural events that God is doing when the trumpets and the seals are opened and God's wrath is poured out it is God's wrath and subsequently when Jesus comes at his second coming and his feet touch the ground and the literally earth is divided between his feet and he speaks the destruction of the nations that come out to do battle with him my friend it's not some nebulous thing. It's popular today for people to take the word tribulation and to take all the events of the Bible that are persecution or tribulation and lump them together as one and the same. And so individuals will say, well, the great tribulation, that is that seven years in Revelation when God is dealing, we as Christians are going to be here for that and tribulation is something we go through. My friend, there's a big difference between the wicked doing evil against Christians and God judging, right? 
There's a big difference between the between somebody harming me who hates God and God harming me. And Christians today don't understand that. And the consequence of a misunderstanding of that is a really skewed opinion about the character of God and who God is. The notion that a righteous God who's already judged His Son will also judge you is both arrogant and scandalous. The notion that a God who's already judged His Son will also judge you, my friend, is arrogant because it puts you... It puts you as an equal of Jesus, to be quite honest. Of course, the idea that you can suffer in the same way that Jesus did, or that you could stand in the face of God's wrath. Can anyone stand in the face of God's wrath? Can anyone stand God's wrath? No, that's arrogant. The idea that, you know, well, God could judge me, and I, you know, that's just the way it is, and I'm tough, and I can handle it, is arrogant. It's arrogant positively arrogant. You can't stand God's wrath. But Jesus stood in your place. I'm both irritated and personally amazed when people think that they can do things to suffer for God that diminish the sacrifice of the cross. Every year at Easter time, different fools from different places. There's a group in the Philippines, there's a group in, in Italy uh, that have themselves nailed to a cross. And they're just, they're foolish. I, that's a, the nicest thing I could say about them. And what they do is not just stupid. And I did say the word, my wife isn't here. It isn't just stupid. But it's beyond arrogant. The notion that somehow you could suffer for sin and relate to God through suffering versus relating to God through Christ's suffering in your behalf. In other words, what it expressly says is, God, I can suffer on my own. I don't need Jesus to do it for me. I'm a type of Christ myself because of suffering. My friend, you do not identify with Jesus through suffering. Jesus identifies with you. You can't bridge the gap between you and God. Jesus bridges the gap between you and God. And it is a despicable notion to try and think that something that you can do makes you stand worthy of God or that you can even stand in the face of God's wrath. That's what the wicked do, not the righteous. Okay? Um, let's go to, when we talk about eminence though, we, we did see that Jesus has delivered us from wrath to come and that... We are to wait for His Son from heaven. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, very briefly. Matthew 24 and Mark 13 are parallel passages where Jesus is asked three questions. In verse 3 of Matthew 24, the questions are this. As He sat down upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto Him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of Thy coming? and of the end of the world. You see the three questions there in Matthew 24, 3? Many individuals misinterpret end time events in Matthew chapter 4 because they don't know an outline well enough to understand uh, that there are three questions that Jesus answers in order. And so the three questions are, when are, when are the temp when's the bu uh, building blocks on the temple going to be left where there's not one stone standing on another? And then, what are the signs of your coming, and what are the signs of the end of the world? All three of those are separate events. Matthew chapter 24 is not about uh, the rapture. Look at verse 36, will you please? The Bible says, But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, what is the second coming of Jesus? What is it? This is returning. For what? To establish the kingdom. Okay. 
Could we say from the Scripture, we could, uh, could we understand from the Scripture that the second coming of Christ is His coming to deal with, first of all, an Israel kingdom. Uh, it is Jesus coming to judge the earth versus die for sin. The first time Jesus came, His first coming, what did He come for? He came to die for sinners. He came to redeem sinners. The second time Jesus comes, He will come for the express purpose of destroying sin and judging sinners. And that's when He'll set up the kingdom of Israel, that kingdom that was supposed that, that, the, the, that the Jews thought He'd come to set up in the first place. He didn't come to destroy. He didn't come to judge. He came to die for sin. That's the second coming. The second coming in the Scripture is distinctly understood as being a separate event from the rapture. That is, when Jesus doesn't come. When Jesus calls up the saints, my friend, His feet don't touch the ground. We're going to meet the Lord where? In the air, in the sky, and then we'll ever be with the Lord. And that's the next event that is described in verse 42. The Bible says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known him what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now I want to focus this evening, and probably this is where we'll end tonight. Uh, I want to focus this evening on the importance of an understanding of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Imminent mean that it's coming at any moment. The illustration here given to teach the imminent return of Jesus Christ is when a man has a servant who is in charge of his household and things are always supposed to be ready and anytime he comes, things are supposed to be exactly how they ought to be. I've seen this in real life a few times. Restaurant owners, for instance. I remember when I used to be a manager at Taco Bell. And one of the things that I always wanted to, to really kind of represent the way I managed under my watch was that I always wanted to, to be when the owner walked in for everything to be exactly how he liked things. Remember the first time I ever met the owner, and I would have been 16 years old, he took a liking to me. He was a really nice man, and a lot of people were really afraid of him, and I was afraid of him. He used to yell at everybody. And uh, I remember he called me out to the lobby. He said, Ryan, he said, you know, it's really important to me uh, that the customers really feel a personal connection here. It's really important to me that you make sure that anybody in the lobby uh, is talked to, addressed, and really treated like they're special. And that was something he, he wanted. Another thing was one time he came and he pointed out uh, dust on top of the ceiling fan to me. Hey, so you know how disgusting it is to have dust on top of a ceiling fan? And it really bothered him to have dust on top of a ceiling fan. I never noticed it before that. But I, I made sure whenever I cleaned the lobby or whenever I had my guys that were the lobby attendants, that was something they did every night was dusted the tops of the ceiling fans. The bathrooms were supposed to be clean. And there were just a couple of things that he thought were really important when he showed up that needed to be happening. And so on my shifts, those were just things the boss wanted, and that's the way it was. And it wasn't so difficult, actually, to just focus on the things that he wanted. And it really did make the business better. He had some things that he understood about uh, customer service and about presentation that really, really helped a lot. And so I'd always try to be ready. Uh, another good illustration of the second coming. Uh, I, we used, I used to have, there used to be some people that went to our church at Delray Beach that worked for some ultra-rich people. Matter of fact, that's what they did. They actually serviced ultra-rich people and catered to their uh, idiosyncratic desires. Okay, there, uh, there was a group of people, uh, there was a family that this lady was telling me that they serviced in West Palm Beach and their job was to hire somebody to make sure that they had fresh sandwiches 24-7 in the refrigerator. Literally, the owner of the house wanted to be able to 
whenever at a whim he wanted to eat that sandwich. It was a particular sandwich. And he wanted to be able to grab a sandwich that was fresh anytime he wanted to. So literally, there was a person whose job it was to make sandwiches and throw them away all the time. So they made sandwiches. You know, it's time for a fresh sandwich. Change it out. And I think it had to be like 15 minutes. Like every 15 minutes you had to make a sandwich. So, you know, sandwiches do get soggy after not very long. You say, that's really wasteful, Pastor. Well, you know something, when people are ultra rich, they have to figure out ways to be special. And so this was one of the ways. Okay, they literally would not tell the sandwich maker if they were going to be out of town. for. They just literally had a guy or a crew that made sandwiches. Wow. Made a sandwich, threw the sandwich away, made a sandwich, threw the sandwich away. Every 15 minutes, 24-7, 365 days a year. And they expected that any time they wanted to, they could go to the refrigerator. This sounds like a dream, doesn't it? I mean, go to your refrigerator in a fresh sandwich, you know? I mean, the one you want. There. All the time. Never have to wait. Just go to the refrigerator and get the sandwich. And they had a sandwich maker that was their job. Okay. Now, what if you had word that the boss is out of town? How important is it to make a sandwich when the boss is not there? Well, you don't think it's very important unless it's what you're paid to do, and that's what the boss wants, actually. And there's a very, very important aspect of eminence. I remember back in the 1980s, I, I think it was 1988. Oh, yeah, it was. It was like in, kind of in the fall. I think so. I remember it. I remember Would have been. You remember the, the Jesus was coming back that day? Yeah. Paul Harvey was commenting on it. And uh, literally, I think for the whole, uh, you know, when Paul Harvey did his, you know, his news thing, he basically devoted the day to talking about what everybody was doing because Jesus was supposed to come back that day. So he talked about the lady that, you know, put out a new front rug and what people were throwing away. He just talked about what people were doing on that day because they thought Jesus was going to come that day. There have been many individuals that have tried to say that they know what, the, what Jesus said that the angels don't know and that he doesn't know. But there have been a lot of people that have tried to guess when Jesus is going to come. But Jesus actually wants us to believe in imminent return. In other words, if you were convinced that tonight Jesus were going to come, the way you'd spend your time and what you would do, if Jesus is going to be here in 15 minutes, the way you'd live and what you'd do if you really understood that and if you really believed it would be different than if you didn't think Jesus was coming. And I'll end today by saying that the popular trend today of believing that the imminent return of Christ is not something we look forward to. That is that events that are in Revelation are going to set in place and happen gradually at least until the midpoint of the tribulation period completely does away with what Jesus wants us to believe. And that is that Jesus is coming suddenly and He's like a man that's on a long journey and you don't know when He's going to get back, but He's coming. And as soon as He gets here, you better be ready for Him. And there are a lot of scriptures that teach the imminent return of Jesus Christ in that sense. Mark chapter 13 uh, and verse uh, verses 32 through uh, the end of the chapter, Luke chapter 12, verses 38 through 40, and 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 are some passages we won't have the time to get to this evening. But my friend, the doctrine or the Bible teaching about the imminent return of Jesus Christ is an extremely vital truth that actually affects how we live. When we believe it, and when we begin to live in light of it. Many of the same individuals that don't believe that Jesus is coming at any time are individuals that try to redevelop the requirements for the gospel in order to compensate for an appropriate level of fear that we ought to have as believers not that we would be lost, but that we would be found not so doing. In other words, that the sandwich isn't made when the owner comes home 
or practically speaking, that we're not living for Jesus when He returns. What a tragedy would it be if some of the places you go, you'd be there when Jesus comes. Or some of the things you think about, you'd be dwelling on when Jesus comes. Or some of the things you do, you'd be doing when Jesus comes. See, the imminent return of Jesus Christ is a practical, practical doctrine that when we believe and we live out, affects how we live. And I hope that's a help for you this evening because it's a transcendent truth. Father, thank you for what we've learned. And I just pray that in the next several opportunities we have to, uh, to, to deal with these matters, that you would just instruct and inform us on the basis of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take some prayer requests tonight, can we?